So welcome to yet another episode of Animation Dissection, the podcast where we take cartoons, tear them apart, look at their insides, and then hastily reassemble them into a Frankenstein's monster that disproves the notion of a loving god. I am R. Magnuson, also known as Nixie, here with Zorak. Hi. And we are going to be talking about Bob's Burgers, the uh, currently running uh, show animated sitcom on Fox. So uh, let's maybe start off with just kind of a brief introduction on the creation of the show, uh, the people behind it. So the show uh, started broadcasting in 2011 and is currently airing the fourth season, which actually contains episodes from the third and fourth season production orders. So the seasons have been kind of been split up in really odd ways, so it's kind of hard to say what season is currently in production or airing because everything's kind of messed up. So the series was created by Lauren Bouchard, who was the mastermind behind a lot of uh, series that were on Comedy Central and various other places. So I think the earliest one was Dr. Katz, which was in, I think it was Comedy Central in the really old days, like before when uh, someone else was hosting Daily Show, like that old, like or like mid mid late nineties, I think. Yeah. Um, and then he moved on and did Home Movies. Um, I can't remember what network that was on. I think it was UPN at one point. It's moved around multiple networks because I know that that's one of those ones that's been syndicated on many different places. It was on Cartoon Network for quite a while, as I recall. Well, I don't think it was actually it? like I'm talking about. I'm talking about the original. Broadcast. Yeah, I, I don't know where it's originally on. Yeah, I could not tell you. Yeah, I think it was like syndicated so... on many places because it, it ran a not a long time, but it ran a decent. I think it was like five years or something. Yeah, I mean, usually the magic number is something like either 88 to 100 episodes. It actually did so, air originally on Cartoon Network. I just looked it up. Huh. Oh, okay. Good to know. Um, so, and then he moved on and did, uh, it was kind of short-lived, but it was an Adult Swim. It was called uh, Lucy, Daughter of the Devil. Um, there was originally the pilot, but it was quite a few years before it even had an actual run for a series, but that only lasted one season. And then um, something that only I think a few people might remember is uh back when abc had the one saturday morning block there was a show called science court which was i think later rebranded as squiggle vision but back when it was called science court he was actually a pro uh, producer and director on that show and it very much shows because it has that home movies dr cat style but of course uh not as edgy by any means but it was a cute show um and then uh so not only is he the executive producer creator but there's also he shares that title with uh, Jim Dautrieve, who was also a producer and writer on King of the Hill, uh, the character Bill Dautrieve being named after him, of course. So there's there's a pretty good group of people behind this show, I think. So that that can, that credits to a lot of I think the strong writing behind it. Um, let's see, and also the art design. So the, the, which was which is a bit controversial, I think, originally at first, but people have gotten used to it. But the art designer behind it, uh, his name is Jay Howell. And I can't remember any other shows before this that he was working on, but he is currently running a show on Nickelodeon called Sanjay and Craig. And you can kind of see a lot of the similarities there. A um, bit, bit more saturated colors, though, but it's definitely kind of like that art style to some extent. Um, and the animation studio is Bento Box. Um, which is which... A, a hilarious name. Yeah, I mean, well, for certain people, it's a hilarious name if you have certain uh, references in your mind. But uh, so Bento Thank Box is welcome. interesting because th this show is really well animated and actually kind of looks really good in a lot of respects. But Bento Box is also responsible for uh, Brickleberry, which is the show on uh, Comedy Central um, that has the whole produced by Daniel Tosh thing behind it and it. It's very kind of cheaply animated, a bit derivative of Family Guy in style. I've never they also even heard do, of that. Yeah, it's um, I'm not I'm not a fan of it, but I mean, you, know. you, you did not sell me by going, oh, Daniel Tosh, like that. That's clearly yeah. a sign of you know <laughs> excellence. Yeah, they also did um another short-lived series that was called Alan Gregory, which was on Fox, which I was fine with the art style, but I thought was actually just a really horrible show. Good art style though, I never and even then. Heard of that. Yeah, and then there's also, I think, a, uh, a Hulu original show called The Awesomes that they do. What is with all these but, shows I've never heard of before? Well, they're, they're, not, they're not, I think, um, wildly popular, so they don't – and, well, Alan Gregory died. I mean, it didn't last very long, so 
that was I think uh, that was the Jonah Hill vehicle. Ah. So, but this is I think a show that really kind of shows off a lot of the talent that actually is in the studio. Uh, I think from from the layouts, which I think are really fantastic. They're full of like really nice lived in details. Um, they don't necessarily need to be painted to 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 be good. So I've always been really impressed by the way they do the backgrounds. They feel like real places, and they're very well observed. You know, like you look at the house or the interior or the restaurant, and it doesn't feel like a generic IKEA you know apartment. You know, like I'll call like I, I call a lot of the backgrounds you see in shows like Family Guy. I call them uh, like web comic backgrounds. Like back in the back in the late '90s, early 2000s, when every web comic you draw like a couch, maybe have a framed picture in the background, but it didn't really look like a specific space that was like lived in by characters. I actually have a question about this because this is probably something you're a better person to ask about this and probably be more, more comprehending of this. Do they reuse like shots in the sense of like the, the uh, environments that the characters are in? Cause I don't know if it's just that they, they frequently just are often in like the same positioning or it, are they strictly actually just, you know, redrawing the characters into these, you know, backgrounds again and again, where they just have a, uh, a set, you know, stock essentially for them or. I, I, it depends on the, on the production and it depends on kind of the ideology of the people making it. I think for a show like this, because it is not an action oriented show and it has a lot of repeating locations that are always kind of, in the same context. So it, it, in a sitcom like show, you're going to have the same house in the same kind of view. Yeah. I just know that they often, they, but, they often centralize on the same locations. They often use very similar, like the actual shots where the characters are, you know, well, they, they have yeah. decent enough range, you know, where they have, you know, multiple views of the different parts of the, you know, the restaurant, the house, but then it's kind of just seems like, Oh, you, you, you see these shots like this shot looks familiar. <laughs> well, well, they, they do reuse it. And I think that it's I think it's just which is fine. I, I was just curious because I wasn't 100% well, on that. I was like, you know, I'm not 100% sure. Well, the way a lot of these will do is they will reuse what they can. Yeah, but they'll just redraw when they can't. Yeah. So and, and the issue is you can't always just take the actual background image and blow it up or shrink it yep. because that screws up the line quality, even if you're using flash. So what you often end up doing is you'll take the background drawing and then blow it up and then re-ink it. So if you have a close-up, it so it won't look like you suddenly have these weird w lined width variations. Um, and not all shows do this, but I think the good ones do. So you'll get like for okay for example if you watch an episode of let's say Johnny Test or something like that and you you'll God really help notice my soul. yeah God, God God rest your soul if you have to try to do that but let's say you do watch an episode and you see a close up or you know a a, a pull out you'll definitely notice the contrast in the line widths hmm. because they aren't being redrawn when you zoom in that face is not being redrawn to you know match extra detail or less. It's just a symbol that is being blown up. And when you do that in Flash and a lot of these vector programs, the outlines also grow along with the, the rest of it. So, but I think Bob's Burgers is fine. I think they do some redrawing of it because I don't notice that problem. Yeah, I, I wasn't even going like, to say it. Like, even if they had just reused shots constantly, I wouldn't really blame them for it, you know, because it's... It's basically, you know, if they're going to be redoing the same, you know, essential, you know, scene, no real reason for them to redo the backgrounds or anything. It just, I was just curious because I, well, the, I the went show. in 100% noticed or not. It's kind of like, you know, I don't know if I've, it's like, is this identical exactly to like, you know, the same framing that I saw? Because like, I, I basically marathoned through the show, you know, myself. So all at once, I'm like, you know, I've seen this shot before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's true. I mean, here's the thing is like, it, it has a lot more in common with uh, uh, sitcoms than anything. So, right. I mean, if you did this, if you did the same thing with a sitcom, you would have that same kind of issue pop up. And the animation itself is kind of like a, it's this kind of mixture between puppeting and drawn animation. Mm -hmm. So when they need it and when they want to make something not look awkward, they will actually redraw it themselves. Yeah. So it's not, and it, so it doesn't have that kind of perfect tweeny kind of look. Mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know, tweening is when you set uh, a key keyframes and then have the computer fill in the motion in between, which often results in hyper smooth, kind of oddly, creepily mechanical puppeting 
Um, and the show is oddly, I think, for a lot of like the cheaper broadcasts on TV these days and a lot of the puppeting that's used, it uses it very well. And it often breaks out into these really crazy animated sequences that are really done well. Um, I'm thinking of uh, specifically there's this great dancing sequence, uh, I think done by, oh, what's what's his name? Uh, Jimmy Pesto, uh, Jimmy Jr. In, in the Taffy Factory. Um, when he's like, don't tell me not to dance, Dan! You know, like, and he's, uh, and he, it, it, the whole thing is really, you can't puppet that. Yeah. There's no way to do that. And there's, like, a bunch of really great shots, and every once in a while you go, like, holy crap, that's, like, really well done. So they have people behind the scenes who know how to animate really well, and the puppeting is there not just to save time, but it's also, I think, the nature of the show. It's a very verbal show. So much of the humor is the verbal tics yeah. and the performance of the characters. Yes, there is some you know physical slapstick, but it is such a verbal show that puppeting becomes like the most well the 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 best way of using it. You know, you wouldn't use the anime techniques you know to do a show like no, this no. by any means. It's a but very again, intelligently like, made show in general, like where you, you can see kind of the hand of moving over each episode where everything is. Just in general, it's really well constructed. It's meticulous. Yes, yeah. I mean, and they they filled like the background with tons of characters, so they feel. I mean, again, it comes down to the fact that the environments that these characters live in feel very lived in. Yeah, you know, they they have this kind of realism to it, and that I think that draws you into kind of like the the awkwardness of the characters, and it feels kind of it feels very realistic, and, and that's one of the things I really like about it. I think also one of the nice the nice things about it. Um, and I, I don't think we're the only ones who have ever made this observation, is that the show kind of um, embraces weirdness. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, a lot of the characters are kind of what you would consider society's outcasts. But the show itself doesn't really treat them with disdain or mockery. And in fact, I think it has a lot of sympathy for these characters. I mean, the, the highest crimes in the Bob's Burgers universe is to kind of be that person who is very cruel interpersonally and to have, you know, kind of a, to put on airs, to be arrogant and things like that. Yeah. You know, th that's the heart, that's the highest crime being weird or being different or being any of the things that let's say, you know, an episode of family guy would make fun of. Those are not really the big crimes. It's, it's the, it's being cruel is the high crime. So like you'll have, what was it? The most recent episode, which was a, uh, a kind of a send up of bronies, essentially the the equestronauts, or what they call themselves the the equestricals, because they have testicles and they're men. <laughs> um, you know, it, it wasn't really making fun of them all that much. I mean, the the character it certainly was, did in the sense of the of the, the joke they made, like, like oh no, dad's in danger. It's like please, <laughs> he's surrounded by men dressed as ponies. He's in the yeah. least possible danger a human being could ever be in. Well, yeah, so at the same time, I don't think it was as cruel, and I think the show really saved— It wasn't It wasn't like a straight-up, you know, kind of parody in the sense of we're going to tear this apart, you know, and destroy it. It was a parody yeah. in the sense of, like, basic satire, where it's like, here's this concept, and here's an element of we think would make an interesting episode in other respects. We're going to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, and I think the show, though, saved its kind of harshest barbs— for the villain. Yeah, for, you know? for people and, just and, being greedy and assholes. Well, yeah, and, and also the way the, that kind of group dynamic worked out and of, of these kind of people, you had like the alpha male popular person in some kind of community and the way he treated other people. And I think that was kind of the harshest that the show really was, was towards that type of personality rather than, you know, yeah, there's – these characters, these people are kind of weird, and they're into like a strange show. But and it kind of takes a couple jokes at some of the odd behaviors, but it's it's not venomous, you know. And even even Bob befriends like what was it, uh, Sun Puddle or something? <laughs> like hey, you know, it's like call me later. Hey, you better, <laughs> you know, like and, and well, you know, Bob also like makes friends with a lot of these outcasts, like uh, the character that's been reoccurring, uh, Marshmallow. Oh yeah, I think the the uh, the, the trans uh, woman of the night, essentially, that's in that. Uh, would you call it like a one piece swimsuit all the time? But like, yeah, none of the, yeah. Like none of the characters really like they embrace that. So well, there's a lot of episodes that in general revolve around 
basically the entire episode is basically like the family meets some really a really odd cast of weirdos and basically you know those weirdos end up helping them out or f- being friends like the whole the whole thing with you know when bob became like the taxi driver or the whole thing with the oh. bikers for example oh yeah you know th- those are all the situations that revolved around they meet these weird you know uh he gets involved and meets weird people but you know deep down they're all just nice people you know well, like, it gets to the humanity of them. And again, even if they aren't nice, it still treats them like they're human. Yeah. I mean, it's a really lot a lot of the humor from the show, though, comes from the fact that they are weird, but it's just kind of treated as normal weird. Like, Tina has a oh, lot yeah. of really, really <laughs> weird interests, but her, her parents are basically, you know, just kind of like, oh, that's, you know, it's like, that's just who she is or like, well, like they'll be concerned for her, but they won't only when they... she's doing it in such a way that's d- detrimental to her. The fact that she's yeah, exactly she's the fact that she's like a zombie fetishist and writes you know uh, explicit you know adult friend fiction. It's less that she does it. It's more like oh maybe Don't you shouldn't be loud. telling <laughs> it to your your classmates. That could be trouble. You know. Yeah. No. Exactly. I mean, and like I again, I like the fact that they their parents who support their kids in a lot of ways and they'll they'll put their foot down but at the same time they kind of you know you don't you don't see bob doing the typical sitcom father thing of oh gene's not masculine enough i'm gonna force him to go onto the football team or something like that you know he doesn't make fun of his son for that you know and i I think the characters are kind of self-aware of it and also what's really cool again it's kind of this nice big departure from a lot of the sitcom stuff the siblings and the family don't just hate each other yeah. They actually feel like a family. They laugh at each other's jokes. They join in on a lot of things. They feel like an actual family unit. Mm-hmm. And I, I find that really refreshing in a lot of ways. And I think also what's kind of cool is that even even though the kids have a little bit of um a little bit of precociousness, they aren't too much. M- so. Mainly one of them has for well in the first well, season. In the first they, season they, they, well, well, two of them have precociousness in different ways. I think uh Gene has a lot of music and cultural references that he there's I don't know how he knows that stuff that's like there's no way he knows all See, that stuff. I don't, what, what Luis in the first season was a little pushing my you know kind of uh, suspension oh, of disbelief. You know the first season explicitly, where it's kind of like, you know, this is a little too precocious. This is outright just like, yeah, it, it, it was kind of pushing it a bit, and they they dialed it back since then, like in the further seasons, where she's oh, yeah. she's she's still like you know. The intelligent manipulator and, you know, and just manipulates everyone around her and is kind of an asshole and shit. But it's... But she's not world-weary by any means. No. I I think that's one of the big things with The Simpsons is that the kids, uh, at least in recent seasons, they don't feel like kids. Yeah. Yeah, The the references they make, I mean, you could kind of forgive it of Lisa somewhat, but even then, the way way they think about things was too adult-like. And the fact is that, yes, the kids might know something a bit different, but the kids still behave like kids. Yeah. And I really appreciate that because it's really rare to see that type of thing because everyone else will usually go for the easy joke of, ha it's a kid, but he but he behaves a lot like an adult, et cetera. I mean, it, it's it, that kind of easy, uh, simplistic way of dealing with humor and dealing with writing children. you know. And I think it's also a show that knows how to write female characters oddly well you know like uh you usually you'll see a show again like family guy for example it has no idea how to write a female character and i think is actually a show that seems to hate women <laughs> but th- this show i think and despite the fact that it it is all uh most of the voices including the women are voiced by men i still say that i think it sh- still treats women a lot more equally than a lot of other comedy shows. It allows them to be funny characters. It's not always having them be the love interest or the goal for the main male character. I think it actually lets them have their own agency in a lot of ways. Well, it, in general, they tend not to focus on the sort of general attributes in terms of that, like, you know, gender or race or, you know, well, it's often that'll be a type of joke or type of, you'd have seen like another show, like maybe a family guy, like the fact that, you know, Oh, this character is you know a woman. Where it's what type of woman jokes we can make or anything. Instead, it's yeah. more like uh, things well, it's like person. It's more. It's more the, the actual characterization is what the joke is. And, yeah, and, exactly. And and, and and gender identity and race identity are not exactly what I would say is you know a character in and of itself. That's you know it's a very basic 
character trait, but I, it, making that the, the crux of a character for the purposes of a joke or, you know, or a story or whatever is a bit, <laughs> a bit off, I would say. Well, exactly, and th- I think that is that type of thought about the fact that we have these characters being developed and we aren't going to just stick in a character to be able to make a bunch of really, you know, one-hit jokes off of this kind of two-dimensional aspect of this character, they're all fleshed out. Mm-hmm. I mean, even the characters that are just incidental, like they might show up for one, only one episode, they're oddly fleshed out. I mean, again, uh, g- going back to the the the, uh, the Questernauts episode, the villain is still, like, pretty well characterized. Like, you see a lot of how he thinks and how he operates, and the, again, the humor comes out of the way he interacts with other people. You know, it, it's it's not just a one note thing that is you know who he is. Um, although I think the closest maybe to being a little bit one note is the character of Tammy, who is the uh, kind of I think the the closest thing to like a recurring villain on the show. Well, she's she's the anti Tina, so you know she's oh, everything yeah. that Tina isn't isn't and that's kind of the joke is that tina is really weird in of herself and then tammy is really weird in a completely opposite direction well, like it, it like it's shallow in the most awful ways yeah. i mean she's a very effective villain i mean um and i really like to see where she goes especially i think her the episode about her uh was it the bar mitzvah yeah it was a bar mitzvah ba, ba, uh no sorry a bat mitzvah yeah you're uh, right you're correct yeah, yeah yeah um that that was a fantastic episode uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, but I, th- I think Tammy makes a very good villain because I think at the same time she is recognizable. Yep. You know, I, I think all these characters are relatable, and I think th- I think the show kind of speaks to this kind of. I, I always find the idea when someone says relatable, it, there's kind of like this false dichotomy that comes out saying like, oh well, the character has to be like uh, this. It has to be generic, kind of fits, generic it to be checks relatable. whatever marks like, are necessary to say, like, oh, it is, you know, a single white 20-year-old male. He relates to our audience, and it's like, eh. Yeah, exactly, and and I think that's the problem is that relatability is something a lot deeper than that, I think. It's not just a matter of, like, self-transposition. Yeah, exactly. Uh, re- relatability, you, you can still empathize and sympathize and understand a character even if they aren't like you or if they come from a different place. I think if you are a good writer and you establish a character's personality and you can understand why they behave the way they do and why they're feeling the certain emotions the way they are, that is relatable. You can understand it. It's the or shared human it's condition. Yeah, or even if you you know don't sympathize with them but you recognize that behavior out in the world, yeah. I think that's also relatability. So. But- you know, I mean, for, I, I mean, I, really, if you can, if you have an effective writer, you can take someone from a completely different, you know, completely different, you know, background and everything. You can make it relatable simply from the essence and standpoint of, you know, human empathy, you know, in the sense of like, oh, I can relate to them in the sense of the human experience. And, you know, and even if they are going through something completely, completely different from anything I'm familiar with. The fact that they're a person I can understand, you know, from just thinking like, oh, I once too had a dream, you know, or whatever. You can, you can relate to that on that level, and solid writing and good characterization drives a lot of that. Yeah, exactly. And it's really nice to see a show that doesn't get kind of caught up in trying to appeal to a specific kind of denom- you know, lowest common denominator or anything like that. And again, like I, I think a lot of the people that they show, you – you see those people in real life. I mean, when you're a kid or even as an adult, you see people like Tammy out in the real world. You see people like uh, Daryl out. In the, I mean, you see all sorts of these types of characters, and they're very well observed. And you go like, okay, they might be weird or they might be a little bit exaggerated here, but they come from a sense of observation. You know, and I, again, I think it comes back down to the the way the show treats outsiders. It treats everybody as if. They're human beings in a lot of ways. It, it certainly they might feels be weird, like a, but they they still feel grounded. It certainly feels like of many, unlike many cartoons, it certainly feels like a post-internet show, in the sense of there seems like, it's kind of like the whole thing of like weird Twitter. You know, we, we've gotten to a point where people mm. appreciate weirdness in and of itself, where it's not something that's detrimental or something that's considered. You know, it, we're less conformity driven. Yeah, and it's well, it definitely that's definitely kind of an aspect of the internet itself, and you definitely see that here. You kind of have this mini, you know, uh, dichotomy, well, you know, like f- widespread, you know, spectrum of all sorts of different weird, and it's like interesting. Yeah, 
and I think um I think uh the only other show I could think of that kind of has this type of grounding would be King of the Hill. Yeah. Although I think King of the Hill with its villain the way I think King of the Hill dealt with villains was a little bit more shallow than the way this show does. Well, King of the Hill also had a lot of episodes built around the fact of oh Hank needs to teach Bobby to be more like a proper man. Oh, maybe Hank needs to get more perspective about this kind of thing. Like you had an awful lot of episodes that were like that. Or, yeah. or Hank, or, or Hank Hank learning Hank, that the just in general something and just getting a better, you know, perspective. And they, or they repeated Hank it. versus liberal stereotype that, you know, that goes too far and Hank saves the day. I mean, again, that it, it it dealt with it a lot differently, and at when this when Buzzbreakers first aired, I kind of was a little bit worried that the show was going to kind of go down that angle. Um, I think especially with the initial characterization of Mister Frond, the guidance counselor, yeah, um, and also I think even the food inspector and all that. But I think the show really found a way to go far beyond that. It's it's less about their jobs, and their jobs are more a means for them to express their own characters, though. It's less yeah. about any aspect of, oh, food inspectors are all blankety-blank. It's more, hey, he is an asshole. This, 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 well, this, this guy has it out for him specifically. And he's like, specifically he's abusing his character. job for it. And, you know, oh, yeah. and with, with like and Mr. He's a pet, but at the same time, he's a sad, petty little man. Yep, literally you know, a little and, man. <laughs> and there's all these little different aspects to his character that you go like, okay, I can actually – I don't agree with him. I don't, you know, I maybe, I maybe don't sympathize with him, but like you understand where he's coming from yep. and why he behaves the way he does. I mean, again, he's so well characterized that even as a villain, he still feels human. Uh, you know, it's so easy to take villain characters and then just, you know, define them as like kind of a villain 2D character. I think they do a lot more with the show. And I think small little details like that really help drive just drive the narrative really well. Mr. Fron kind of comes the, one of the closest to a repeatable villain for the kids themselves, I would say. True. I mean, he, he's not – And like, he doesn't have a lot – I don't know if he's like – he's relatable in the sense that we've all seen people like him who are just kind oh, of – Oh, yeah. I mean we all probably could think of someone who's kind of uh, – how do you even describe his personality where it's kind of uh, – uh, Well, well he's, he's, he's kind of egotistical. In yeah. a lot of ways. Um, he He's kind of like – imagine if a new age person went to psychology. He, well, that, that sounds like a lot of people in general in psychology where it's kind of – they have this idea of like, oh, if we do – Well, it's a holistic kind of – Yeah. It's, it's, it's holistic psychology. I mean, again, he's a schooled guidance counselor. He, he – uh, I think there's even a joke that he might not have, like, the proper credentials for whatever position he actually has. Yeah. Um, but again, but if, I think the idea behind him is that he himself, though, has so many untreated psychological kind of issues, and yet he's, you know, he's a lot less stable than the children that he is supposed to be the guidance counselor for. And I, th I think, oddly – the the school and the kids and the parents end up being the therapists for him more so than well, anything else. Well, some they they, they don't ever. That's the thing. They never really fix him. He is like the one of the most tormented characters. Well, the like show. yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I think know. of that one episode of uh, where they uh, where they all did the short stories. Yes, where, I mean, they kind of tried to, like they kind of cheered him up a little bit. Where they, except yeah, it is it's uh, it's undercut in the end. But you know, the idea is that I'm not saying it's successfully treating him. I'm saying that the way he interacts with the rest of the world is that he's almost the patient rather than the the doctor or the guidance counselor. Sure. Like it's the it's it's, it's the idea it's, like the madman running the asylum essentially, you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and the, and that's that's what makes his character kind of interesting. And, and yet at the same time he has this kind of egotism behind him that is not warranted. So there, that's that's what makes him interesting and kind of funny. Um, I mean, but again, like, I don't think he's villainous in the sense that he means ill. No, he, he certainly he means well. He needs I, I, th I think he's just completely ill-equipped to do what he's supposed to be doing. Yeah, th definitely. He, he doesn't have either, the, like, say, the background or, you know, the, uh, the right the – right, yeah, the right, <laughs> the, Yeah, the right, he doesn't have the right personality or kind of anything, you know, or uh, – will to deal with his job essentially he is he is very easily broken at all times and manipulated 
I, I actually I think the shallowest ones, like only ones I can think of that are the shallowest are at least as a recurring one, are the people from the art supply store. Or Jimmy Pesto. Oh yeah. Well Jimmy Pesto Jim- the thing is Jimmy Pesto is Jimmy Pesto is literally anti Bob. And the thing is yeah. most of Jimmy Pesto's negative traits are also identical to Bob's negative traits, except for the whole fact that, that Jimmy Pesto is is successful and, and well, at least financially. He's successful I mean, he's, and he's, he's divorced. Di- but but he's divorced. He's really bad with his kids. Like he does he doesn't notice that they're missing. Yeah. You know, I mean a lot of th- I mean he's he, he's not a good I mean his food is apparently not supposed to be very good. It's just that it's popular. And, he, mean, and he's, whereas, he's a good businessman, apparently. Yeah, whereas Bob is very good, apparently, at what he does, but he has no idea how to market himself or run a business. So, yep. like, he's kind of like the, the artist versus the the manager type of style person. Yep. Um, I mean, it would be kind of nice if I think the show would get – but I think the show in general has really kind of gone a little bit beyond the restaurant. You know, I mean, it, it's it is called Bob's Burgers, and he runs a burger restaurant. But the show is so not about the restaurant anymore, and it barely features in. Well, it, it pulls uh, back pretty often. Episodes. It, it pulls yeah. back pretty. I mean, they, they. I think they're cognizant of the fact that they don't just want to, you know, spin off completely. They don't want to go into like Simpsons levels of you know zooming off into anything they could possibly just stick the characters into. Uh, it yeah. seems thus far that they've been pretty cognizant of the fact. Though I, I do worry about the fact that they sometimes repeat certain like kind of character driven uh plot lines, like the whole the stuff with like, Linda where she gets she gets overly obsessed and you know and into something and kind of deludes herself and then at the end she learns like, Oh, maybe I shouldn't have gotten so hyped up like the whole thing with for example with her getting where she thinks she has psychic powers. Yeah, that like, that's was, a that very was a little Lin- bit of a miss. That, that's that a, was a bit of a miss. It's, it's a very Linda type of thing where she just all of a sudden has something happen. She gets overly into it and she gets kind of obsessed, obsessed, obsessed with whatever thing. And then at the end, she's like, "Oh, maybe I got a little too, you know." Well, I think it works in, it. in. I think it works in certain situations. It works um, in like this, in like as like a. I think it works as like a B plot, or you know, when it's not. The well, like uh, plot. when she does the, when she was working in that kind of Trader Joe's parody, I think it worked out. Pretty that was well. good. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, and I liked also. I think it was just a one-off joke, or at least they've brought it up once or twice. The the porcelain babies. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they've yeah. mentioned that several times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I I think that's just. I mean, it's it's good to have. I, I think it's consistent with her character, like that she takes to things very quickly and becomes obsessed with them. Um, and, and I think that's actually kind of a fun, as long a fun trait. But as long as it doesn't get too bad, I think it works really well in episodes like when she becomes obsessed with the idea of uh, the family taking sailing lessons. I I I, th- I just find that kind of fun. And yeah, I like when of, she like, has a just great minor detail. When she has obsessions, um, it's fine. It's more or when she takes Luis to that mommy class, and she beca- and once there is now an award for the best parent, she now has to you know there's there's a certain level of pride. I think she she has a little bit of the uh, kind of Peggy Hill in her. Yeah, a little I, bit. I, I, but I, without, I, the, I, without the arrogance though, she does not have arrogance, but she gets. She's very passionate and throws herself into something entirely and then kind of doesn't realize what's going on around her until she's already kind of stepped in it. See, I think she's an interesting character. It's more that it, sometimes it's like when it's the focus of the episode, it gets kind of – it's like, okay, we, we know where this is going. We have been down this path before. You know, It's kind of just like in and of – if it, that's the focus of the joke, like the whole thing with her getting psychic powers where it's just like, oh, Bob was right. All along, it's like okay. If that's the focus of the episode, it kind of just like eh, it doesn't really yeah. do much. And well, then, thankfully, then, uh, we well, haven't. Usually, had a lot of it, it very rarely also goes with anybody being perfectly in the right. No, it, it doesn't. It, it's it, like it, it kind of it doesn't it kind of stays away from that kind of simple that simplistic kind of solution at the end. It's it, it doesn't go into simple moralism, which I really yeah. like. Well, what um, I, one aspect of the show I do enjoy is the fact that often the family are just straight up, just like uh, they're, they're straight up, just kind of asshole moments sometimes where they're all just being assholes to each other, but it's not like we're, it's not cruel. It's not cruel, they, but it and, it still kind of feels like all... you're just being an ass right now. You just sometimes get this well, like sometimes like Bob gets like stuck in like that type of thing, like with, uh, with like Gene learning baseball, and Bob is just, oh, just like yeah. just, he's being he's being an ass, but at the same time, like you know, he's kind of right, but he is being an ass about it. Yeah. Well, I think also like um, 
one of the things I really like about the kids is that they kind of act as this – well, episodes where it's not about the kids and it's more about Bob and Linda, the kids act as like this kind of Greek chorus. Yeah. If that makes any sense, uh, I guess it, I guess I should define it. You know, Greek chorus is a kind of like outside characters that are inside there, but they're kind of acting as people who comment on what's going on. It's like kind of a little bit of a meta narrative thing, and they they act as really good. Uh, they just make such great little observations about what's going on. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, even though they aren't they aren't directing the plot. They are just there. It's almost like they're on the outside looking in at the same time. It's really interesting how they do that. And I think overall the performances on this show are amazing. Yeah, <laughs> the, just the, the the voice acting. Um, I think the as far as I'm aware of the way the scripting is done is that yes, the show is scripted, um, but they let the actors you know they'll read the script, but they also let them improvise a little bit, and then they kind of make decisions on whether or not they want to keep certain improvisations and things like that. So I, I think that helps a lot, and I do. Th- I think they also all record with each other, of course, mm-hmm. which I think really helps a lot of performances. I, I presume uh, some of the stuff, at least like thinking like certain things that have to be improvised. I presume like most of the stuff, like Linda singing, has to be improvised to some degree. Oh yeah, because like <laughs> that 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 entirely is hard to script. Like now sing this phrase, you know. It's like. Eh. Yeah, yeah that, well, that they might they might, they might have a direction that she sings, but she probably I think makes up the songs. And yeah. oh man, the the songs and the music in this show. <laughs> they, they, that, that's one thing I've heard. Like when I would first decide, like I'm gonna watch Bob's Burgers, I'm gonna do this. It was funny because one of the things like, oh, have fun with the voices in the sense of like that everybody has really like annoying <laughs> voices deliberately. And yeah. that, that ties it off a little off to the singing and stuff. So it's kind of, it, honestly, I'm not that bothered by it because I find the voice acting. Oh no, I love the songs. I, 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 I think the songs are amazing, and they're actually gonna they uh, they're making a CD album of Bob's Burgers songs. Really? I think. Yeah, I, I think that's gonna be really interesting. I, mean, I, I don't know if I'd want to own that, but I, well, I don't if, think it's I don't think it's of songs in the show, but that. It, I, I I I don't know exactly what's going on with it, but like it's like when you look at the post credits stuff, there's some really interesting. Songs okay, yeah, there. there's some. They have some funny like little parody stuff, or you know, like one off stuff from like a uh, show. Well, that's what like I think that. what they're talking about is like the stuff that the the kind of thing that runs over the credits. Okay, yeah, that I would or, probably or be fine even with. the the Topsy song, which was really good. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd probably be fine owning something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so like, there, there, but again, like, there's this great little creativity in there that I really like, and I think it uses music in really funny ways yeah it's it's i don't know it's just such a good show <laughs> i mean uh i mean yeah i mean my my verdict on the show is i mean even though it's still running is that i think it's a really well-written show i think it's i think it's honestly one of the best things that's on fox right now in terms of the uh, animated honestly, probably i would say is the best i would personally say uh I mean, I know you like American Dad to some degree. I can't. But that's being that's it. being shoveled off to somewhere else. Well, there, but, there um, you go. It is the best show on Fox, I would say. Yep. So it's, it's it's probably one – I would say like it's – one of the aspect I like about the show is how it gets really fucking dirty. <laughs> and not like the sense of like in the kind of like kind of like, oh, they're making, you know, like a uh, – Innuendo, you mean? It, well, in the sense like it makes a lot of jokes. It's kind of like feels like, oh, they aired this during primetime kind of jokes. Like they make like uh, a lot of references to uh, – I don't know where it feels less dirty in the sense of um, – Well, it's not doing it in like the, the same kind of childish way that you – Like you Family Guy things. type thing. I'm not thinking like yeah, – Like where Family it, Guy where it feels like, oh, like, oh, that is a simply joke. They make some references and stuff that just kind of like, oh – Kids won't get this, but adults are probably just like, pfft, you know, where they spit up their drink and some of this shit. Like, they, like, oh, a lot of the stuff Gene says. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and a lot of the stuff Gene does, and the fact that he doesn't understand what he's doing makes it really funny to me. You know, because, again, kids will often say and do things they don't quite understand but actually have this double meaning. And, again, the, the difference is, you know, the Bob Spurgers does not have a character who is literally a rapist and – play that for laughs yeah. that is not the type of show that it does it will have sexual humor but again it treats it as well no people have sex like that's a part of the way it treats it like oh was it i think one of Luis's things is like yeah he had sex and then we happened deal with it <laughs> you know like it's it, it treats everything very 
matter of factly. I think there's also even a what was it uh, in the Thanksgiving episode where Bob keeps on uh, destroying his turkeys in his sleep, and he keeps on having to go back to the grocery store to buy. Oh, yeah, and the guy keeps on saying he's doing his hit on him. Yeah, to, yeah, because like why why like he must be intentionally you know doing this to cut, keep talking to me. And even Bob at one point he's like it's like oh no I'm into it. Well maybe I am I don't know. And it's it's. It's really funny because at the same time, it's not treating that type of joke as gay panic even. Yeah. Like norm- normally that's like, oh, it's gay panic. It's like, no, it's just like it's it's literally a misunderstanding. And even then, Bob, get, at some point, he – He's he like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe. And, he, and then he was like, no, 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 and, and he leaves. So it's like it's a, it's, it's a kind of a refreshing – take on that type of joke yeah well even with like the like some of the jokes just kind of i feel like we have the whole episode for example devoted to uh linda's grandparents and their summer home in uh in florida where it turns out where it's it's like a sweet a swingers retirement home yeah exactly where it's it's basically (laughs) bob then like saying oh they have to move either they have to start swinging or they're moving in with me well time to convince the the kid into you know this type of thing uh, the grandfather has like a balloon fetish or something like that that feels totally like post internet in the sense because if you have like at all read the internet for any period of time or familiar familiar with like weird internet you just kind of nodded during that like yeah that's that's but something that actually is... exists on the internet, <laughs> or it, it exists as a as a concept. Like it's it's research. Like it's real. It's, it's like that. That is like that is not just a weird joke. That is that is a thing that really exists in the real world. It, it is just as weird as it sounds. Be- and, and yet again, at the same time, I don't think the show is being too harsh on them. For oh that. no, it's just kind of that's just like what well, I find funny. If, well, basically, it was funny because I was like, well, that's your thing, you know. It's like even after at the end of the episodes, it want to go pop a balloon <laughs> with <Yeah>. Linda. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought, I don't know. It's really, I, I just really like it. I think um, I'm trying to remember the other one they did. It was they, they kind of did that pickup artist parody. Where it was like, you know, trap her in the room and then trap her. Oh in yeah, room. and then I remember yeah. Tina was getting hints from it. Yeah, of all like people, she thought that somehow. I mean, it's if she reversed it somehow that you know, like <laughs> in general, can we just talk about some episodes that we like? That actually that'd be good. Yeah, this. I mean, at this point, I mean, there's just to actually analyze. Some, certain there's so episodes. many. There's so many good ones. I mean, it's to kind of go in and pick it out. But I, again, I, I think. I, I I think if you look at each episode, the the way they're kind of crafted is that you have the characters in in a situation that feels relatable in the sense that you you might not relate with the details of it, but you relate with it emotionally. Mm-hmm. You know, I think everybody's been in a position where they feel like they're they're failing despite how how much they try or. They, something that they thought they wanted and they get, and it it kind of becomes a lot more problematic than you'd think. Or you get a, you feel like you're being upstaged by someone who isn't taking it serious, something seriously. Like they kind of have that foundational basis that's that's very human, and then kind of spin off on that. I think uh, uh, the last one I was I, I just said in that list uh, applies to the the beef squatch episode where uh, it kind of hints that. Bob has a little bit of a fantasy of being like a TV chef or a famous chef or something like that. And he finally gets his chance um, on this really kind of really stupid morning show. And he gets upstaged by Gene, who doesn't take it seriously. But it turns out that the whole reason that they got picked for the show is because Gene doesn't take it seriously. So it's it must be like the deepest despair to, you know, kind of get what you want or be on be like on track to get what you want but then it turns out the whole reason is that you're you're actually like the the second banana or the stand-in for someone else that episode is also interesting to the standpoint that it starts off with bob not actually i mean where it's might not literally like a dream that he's like embracing by any means he's convinced yeah. by linda like oh why don't you do that and it's kind of like oh well kind of had you know where he reveals that he actually had you know I mean, it's just kind of one of those dream things that people don't really devote any energy towards, you know, actually thinking oh, well, it'll I, happen he, or hoping. Oh, yeah. And like, then he gets pulled in, fantasy. and then he gets excited, <laughs> and then it's kind of like, oh, well, I wasn't excited in the first place, and then I got excited for this, and it was for no reason at all or nothing to do with me. It's kind of like even worse than actually looking forward to it and then actually getting to it. It's kind of like, oh, I started from negative, then I went positive, and then I went below negative. Yeah. 
Well, and, and it works in a lot of great little plot lines around it. So you have the this kind of imagine like a male Tina, but somehow much more psychologically damaged. You know, like I mean, Tina's weird, but she's not what what that boy was essentially. And then you also have the kind of uh, B plot of what is her uh, the the two hosts. And their their kind of secret life behind the set and their ambitions and and how the family like their lives were kind of ruined by this really kind of mediocre success. Yep. And then Luis acting as this kind of instigator. I think she works very well in this role of she she's the type of person who will throw fuel on the fire. Mm-hmm. And I think that works out really well. Yep. But I, I think overall, though, if I had to say favorite episodes, I think a lot of my favorites are the Tina-centric episodes. See, I would have to agree with that because honestly, I think Tina's my favorite character in the show, and I just, I just don't know, I don't know if I could say why. Just, I don't know. Her characterization feels really authentic, though weird. She's hard to define, yeah. and yet, she, yet you kind of sympathize with her. I mean, I think she's probably the most emotional of the characters. I, ironically, given her... I, ironically, depend you know, g- given the performance, but you know, she feels things. She she gets more passionate about things. I think the fact that she's normally not expressive, it, it kind of gives them a lot more room to kind of give. It, I think the fact that she's normally not expressive, when she does express something, it feels more powerful than the other characters who very easily get into you know, yelling mental breakdowns pretty easily. She's also interesting that she's like the, probably the best person in the show and the standpoint of her overall, you know, personality. Morality. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, you know, she, she's the one who plays mostly by the books. Yeah. Yeah. She, she actually has like morals in the more broader sense. Yeah. And, and I think there's, I think there's a mystery to her thought process that makes her interesting. Mm -hmm. You can't quite exactly figure her out. And the way she views things is so oblique I mean, a lot of her one-liner jokes and observations are like, oh, you know, they make sense, but they, they come from such a strange angle. And, and again, and yet they make sense. Well, it, it really fits with the fact that she is, the, you know, the teen in the family, and she's kind of – she's got all these conflicting emotions that she's getting kind of confused with each other. She, she's yeah. basically got all these wires kind of crossed, and so it results in some really, really well, weird then- things. And not just that, but she is, I think, an inherently anxious. Like, one of my favorite things is the Tina noise. Oh, where she just, anytime she's she slightly she stressed, just, yeah. It, it, yeah, and she just stops and things like that. And I, I think some of my favorite ones are, the again, the Tina Century <laughs> That is right, the fucking episode where, uh, where uh, Bob decides to let her drive the car in the parking lot. Oh, and <laughs> yeah, the car is like a mile away. It, and it's the only car in the parking lot. It's, it's like, just turn left. And she just starts making the noise. And she doesn't uh, turn left because she's freaking out. And it's just like slowly crawling up to the car. Slowly, slowly, slowly. For like two minutes. And then it crashes into the back. Oh, <laughs> it's talking about like slow rolling a joke, too. And, and then again, that also goes into the morality. Because it's they come up with a lie and... It's it's her conflicts with lying and things like that, and and that kind of goes back to your your ethics argument. I'd say one of my other favorites is the one where they have that school news station. Oh, that was a great one. That one I think brought in a lot of the different characters and used them really well. Um, and I think it used the the kids very very effectively. I think I think the the school ends up being one of my favorite locations and in the show they don't use it that you, much though cause... they don't use it that often but like the other students and the other like kids in the show are great like you get daryl you get um jimmy jr um i can't remember his friend's name it's on the tip of my tongue but zeke zeke you know you you have tammy you have uh the twins you have regular sized rudy you have like a <laughs> regular sized of... rudy so... is such a weird returning character too yeah, I mean, it's – it's he looks like Bobby Hill. That was the thing that kind of confused me when I first saw him because he, he dresses very similarly. He has almost a similar hairstyle. He's just not overweight like Bobby is. It's weird that they introduce, like, these minor characters, like, one-offs, and then they return, and they actually use them really effectively where it's, like – it's less what they were used for in the plot is the focus. And yeah, more well, again, just like, – so they're just a character that occasionally reappears. Like the whole thing with like Daryl, for example, where he's you know he's the school nerd. 
And they, well, the way they introduce him is basically within like a nerd stereotype. But then he starts just showing up again because he just he managed to befriend the family and he's used in interesting ways. Well, and he also goes to the same school, yeah. and you know, um, I I think uh, what was it the episode where I think it's the nude beach episode. <laughs> You know, you, you kind of see this other side of Daryl as this kind of, uh, kind of the aspiring nerd, as in the one who kind of wants to, to. He's the he's use, the entrepreneur, use, yeah. Entrepreneur, and which is a lot like Luis in a lot of ways. You you, but, you also see that aspect of him with the uh, the one Halloween one where he has the list of all the best candy houses mapped out. Oh yeah, exactly. And and again, that's so cool. Is that even these one off characters, they're so well developed. Like you don't know who will be a returning character. But when you, they do, you go, oh, yeah, you just accept it, and they have a lot of material to work off of because they develop those characters so well. I think the show does its homework very early on, and so it pays off when they need to call in other characters again. I think it does it a lot better, I think, than The Simpsons has done with their tertiary characters because I think The Simpsons these days often kind of betrays characterization rather than building off of it. Is it just me, or is Gene a little bit of, like, the, uh, it's, it might sound weird as, like, the worst family member in terms of overall characterization and how he's used? Because he does he, kind he of feel a like bit more simple. Track. Yeah, He is a little bit more simple, but I think that's also just his personality. I think he takes after Linda in a lot of ways. He has that, he'll throw himself passionately into things that he doesn't quite understand. But he sticks to it. Like, even if it's wrong, like, what was it? He's, uh, it was the... Oh, it was this thing about who wrote the Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, and and he he, he keeps on insisting it's Salman Rushdie, <laughs> you know. And and there's some really intelligent like, jokes in this show as well, by the way. Where it's like, oh yeah, where it's and, kind and, of it's, it's like Bob's highbrow. Like, it's, it's not Salman. It's not Salman Rushdie. Look it up on the internet. I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's no. I looked it up. It's Salman Rushdie. It's like he or you know when he when someone corrects him, he's like, no, it's this. He just you know he he's. Yeah, he's I mean, he's, he's a funny character, but he just still feels like kind he, of the he worst. Well, he's... he doesn't have as much depth. I mean, again, even Luis, I, I, I think, well, because I think they're younger. I think I don't know because Luis is used in the sense like her characterization is often like she is super precocious, and that's often used as a joke. The fact that she's intelligent and manipulative, and even though she's still a kid, but she's used for a lot of interesting things. Where Gene tends mm. to be really one track to me. Where he's basically uh, – he, he is the kiddie one that's basically where he's the most you know juvenile. Yeah, it, it's hard to kind of um, – it's hard to, to hinge an episode on Gene Yeah, because he, he is, again, very kind of one track. But I think he's best utilized as this kind of Greek chorus character. Yeah. I mean, um, although I think there have been a couple of Gene episodes that are There's been some good, good. ones. Like, um, uh, the one where that girl tries to push him into dating her. Oh, God, yeah, that was, that was a good one, where he only goes into the relationship because her dad makes jingles. Well, no, like, well, he only insists on staying in it yeah. because of that. I mean, he initially does it because of uh, social pressure and all that other stuff. and He didn't um, want to be a jerk, basically, for a while yeah, there. Yeah, he didn't want to be a jerk, essentially. And again, I, I think he's he's the best at being the character that makes one-off jokes and reacts to other things. Again, I, I don't think they found exactly how to hinge episodes on him because he doesn't have that emotional depth that, you know, I think Bob, I think Bob and Tina have the most – depth to them in terms of under, you know the way they express their emotions and the way they have emotions and their anxieties about the world are a lot more clear mm. you know i i think both linda and uh gene are very kind of carefree they they don't really think about consequences that much so you know it's harder to kind of at least maybe for people with my personality type to kind of relate to them because they live very much in the moment, and they do not look, you know, they do not think things through very much at all. It also feels um, like they didn't, re- they haven't really given Gene an episode that's specifically kind of like touching on like the emotional weight, like the kind of the uh, uh, the toilet episode. Well, the, yeah, but that's even that would end up being more, you know, it felt more manic than anything. Like that's the obsession, like rather than kind of like you have episodes where Luis comes, you know, basically is kind of coming to terms of the fact that, you know, oh, her and her dad really are close, you know, whatnot, or her getting closer to, you know, uh, to Linda, for example, or you certainly have lots of the episodes. boy, ba- the boy band episode. Oh, yeah. With her and, you know, uh, Tina, for example. Yeah. Where you get you get this feelings of like, oh, you, you get a feeling for like their their weaknesses and whatnot. Like what Gene is kind yeah. of like his weakness is that he's dumb, but that's not really a thing where he's like, oh. 
you know, I'm really dumb. He's not interest, He's not smart enough to be introspective or anything. Well, he's not or to have an arc. Even you know, yeah. Luis has I mean, arcs he, occasionally where it's you know because she is self aware and you know Tina's self aware. Yeah, exactly. And I think that I think I think they that's the one one of the characters I think they need to work on. I mean, I I think Gene's a very funny character. I, I wouldn't I remove just, him from the show I, by any means. But no, no. But I uh, I think I think they need to kind of if if they want to hinge episodes on him as the kind of main character and the the one with the the arc, it, it's a bit more difficult because he's better either as kind of like. A little bit of an instigator, or as the um, a, as in the episode you mentioned about uh, Luis and Bob, you know, being close. Oh yeah, with well, the one bond, bond, bonding TV. over banjo, the <laughs> TV show thing. Yeah, I mean, he he worked in that episode better as an obstacle than he was. I mean, he wasn't the driving force behind. And it, it. He wasn't being malicious. But he was, he was but just he, intro. No, into but something. he but he's better as this obstacle. I mean, he's like a he's like a rock. He's not. He's neither, you know, he's not interested in in hurting someone, but he he will by just being there by accident in this case. Yep. Um. So it, it'll be interesting to see where the show goes. I think I think it has a lot of good episodes still in it. Um. I I really hope it it continues going. Uh. It has been shifted to a different time slot, uh. Which isn't usually a good thing for a lot of these types of shows, especially on Fox. Uh, Futurama notoriously was shifted to the 7.30 time slot and was kind of slowly killed by a lot of uh, football games running over and just not being in a very good time slot on a Sunday. But I think in this case, it was only because Fox is running that uh, Cosmos show. We all must make sacrifices for science sometimes, Nixie. Yeah, well, that was great. Is that the the staff behind the show did a a song about the fact that they're being moved to seven o'clock, and it's like it's not our fault yeah. that we're being moved to seven o'clock. It's not like it's it's not we're we're not a bad show, okay? We're just it's it's you know Cosmos is on, and they had to move us around, and we're here. It, it's not because they don't believe in us. I mean, I I think they you know if if they didn't believe in the show. They they would have moved it there sooner, like they did with a uh, Cleveland show, mm-hmm. where they're like, "Yeah, this is this is this is a stinker. We're moving it there." In this case, it was literally just time slot. So I'm, I mean, I'm hoping that it does get back to its normal time slot. And but uh, you know, it's been doing pretty well. There hasn't and it, want the sh- in terms of ratings, I think it. Ha- I think it's very done very well critic uh, critic wise. I think it's done very well internet wise. I, I think I its don't impressions know if ratings that... are pretty decent. I thought I took a look at it. I mean, it's not like at it's not like Simpsons levels or necessary, you know, Family Guy levels, but it's up, you know, it's pretty up there, you know. I, I think it's there to support the show and yeah. keep it from being, you know, retooled and meddled with too much. So I mean, even I mean, worst case scenario, I I would it would not surprise me if some other network picked it up if it was, you know, punted anyways. So I mean, it's yeah, it, I, I'm I, sure I, people people are really appreciating the show from what I can tell. So yeah, so well, I just hope that that appreciation gets uh. Yeah, measured. That's right, because, because ne- uh, networks you know, don't act as rational beings either. That's true. No, well, they they pretend they do because they use numbers, but they they often num- don't numbers act are numbers off. alone. They think, oh, or, we could probably do better, maybe. I guess. Or <laughs> numbers themselves are flawed in in that way. So yeah. there there's a whole bunch of issues there. We might have to do another episode about that. Yeah. So well, wrapping up, uh, I it's you know I I I, I don't think anybody could come up with the the impression that we hate the show by oh, any no. means. Um, I, I think it's a valuable thing. I, I think there is, if you want to examine it as something in terms of understanding character writing, I think it's something that should be looked at in a lot of ways. And in the idea that developing all characters, both the good and the bad, the one-off, I, I think that helps a lot and it pays dividends much later on when you kind of want to pit them against each other and make things conflicted, but even if it's, you know, for comedic reasons or dramatic reasons. It certainly doesn't um, have one-off characters, or, or rather, no, it has one-off characters. It doesn't have one-note characters. Yes. You know, keeping characters not one-note. I mean, even if you're not going to use them again, I think giving them a certain level of depth and observation to the way they behave. You know, they, if they feel like, oh, I've seen that type of personality before. Oh, I've met someone kind of like that. You know, looking at the real world and drawing from that for your comedy, I, I think really does pay a lot. And I, I really, I really like to see more of that type of thing. And I, I think the show does really well. I really hope it continues going uh, for much further. 
Uh, we don't want another critic on our hands. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, I guess just a short thing uh, about what we're currently watching uh, cur right now. Uh, it's, well, because the, the new anime season has kicked off. Uh, we haven't gotten past three episodes of most of the shows yet, but the shows that I have been watching have been, of course, Mushishi, uh, Ping Pong. Uh, well, Space Dandy has ended the first season already. So it's currently on hiatus gonna and it's going to be It's currently back. on hiatus for the next one. Next few months. Um, uh, they, they've actually, uh, apparently, uh, with Space Dandy, it hasn't been selling very well in Japan. The Blu-rays, which I don't, I don't think anybody's particularly surprised in that. It's not gonna. But it's doing, but it's doing well in America. Yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, it's not abysmal in Japan though. It, it's it's doing okay. Yeah. So it's, it's it's not as bad as like someone's where it's like, oh, you know, Kaiba for example did terrible in Japan. I think it sold yeah. like forty Blu-rays. <laughs> Oh wow, well, yeah. Which is it was just sad for Yuasa, but uh, a bit, well, you know, it's it's certainly doing well in uh, the U.S. from the sound of it, where it's actually making pretty decent, you know, airtime, you know, where it's getting a uh, decent enough increase in like viewership, you know, week to week. So the hope, yeah. I, I'm hope that the Blu-rays come out over here soon too, so we can pick. Oh, those I up. would love that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to really... just look at some of those episodes again, just to kind of stare at things like. Ooh. Well, like I, I would love to get one of those um, Sakuga oh, or well, Genga, the get, or the Genga books, the ones with the the like a lot of the ones you can get for I think uh, the ones they made for Gurren Lagann and the ones they made for Fuli Kuli that have the the, the exposure sheets. It would be amazing the for the show just because of the different artists involved. Oh yeah, that's that's why I want oh, it. I want yeah. to see how it's these different animations like work. It's basically a sample platter of like the Japanese animation industry. What's good? Yeah, um, and let's see. In terms of surprises, though, I I've actually been watching a lot of the sports anime, and I I kind of have become a sucker for a few of them, um, even if they're not like great, but there's certain aspects to them. Which so, ones like, are you watching? Um, well, the one I've been watching for a while actually has been. Um, Yoamushi Pedal. Oh, you see, I've heard other people talking about that. I, that I... show has turned out. I mean, um, I, I watched it from the beginning, and I I fell in love with it. I I think it's t delightful. Um, I like a lot of the characters, and there's like great little comedic moments at the end of each episode. They do like after credits kind of like cute little bits that are funny that are really well done and really well. I think all the characters are characterized really interestingly. Um, and then of the two new ones, um, there is Baby Steps which is kind of like this honored student who just decides to learn tennis. Um, there's kind of like a fun little thing about that. It feels a little bit retro, but it, it has some like neat elements. And I think the main character is actually really interesting. Hmm. Um, his personality is kind of fun to see how he, how he views the world and how he interacts with things. Um, and Haikyuu, the characters aren't as interesting, but the animation is actually pretty good. There are, there is are that some a moments production IG one? Uh, I think it is. It's the volleyball one. Yeah. Haikyuu is the volleyball. IG and does has... real – well, IG in general is a very good studio in terms of overall animation production. I mean they, yeah. they, they often make things that are very dull, but they are very well made. And though they, I think they actually have a sub team that explicitly only does sports shows, and they tend to be aimed at a female audience. So they tend to be uh, a bit um, – not like fan servicey, but they tend to be a bit uh, – Little bit on the on the uh, not like fr not like free level. Yeah, well, yeah, well, <laughs> that's kind of like a thing with like, all sports anime. Because isn't that 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 uh, Yawamushi pedal have an aspect of that to it as well? Uh, I, I know I've seen not, animated I... gifts of that guy with his buff oh, ass well, chest. But the, the, the thing is with him, it's it's, it's a gag it's, or something. It, or? It's 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 kind of like a gag, but also it's his. It's like it's like his special move almost. <laughs> Yeah, but it, but, but it makes sense. But it, well, no, it makes sense. I mean, it, it makes sense in the show. I'm, like, I'm sure it does. Explain but... it, but it, it's both treated as a joke and as other things. It's kind of hard. Um, but again, it's also the assumptions is well, you know, is that what women want exactly? Because I mean, the free guys don't look like that exactly. Either. Well, and that was I, a show I, aimed for women. So well, the thing is, it's like, kind of hard to assume what exactly appeals to women or not. Well, the thing is, like a lot of sports shows is that they go for many different physiques. Because some people oh, like yeah. the the, uh, like the the nerdy male lead or whatever who is really uh, petite or whatever, and you know, like, uh, but they, a lot of sports shows in general, they've they've established that the uh, the primary market for them is often you know uh, the female audience. That's why Production IG does a new sports anime basically every season for that <laughs> purpose, where it's basically like, okay, 
Can, can we make the uh, Kuroko no basketball uh, lightning strike multiple times or the slam dunk lightning strike multiple <laughs> times? Basketball yeah. in general seems to be really specific for that, I, I guess. But, uh, yeah. Well, I think the good ones do a good job capturing an emotional journey of the character. Oh, sure. Which I, which I think – I mean, good ones do. There, there's more – I mean, of course, there's always going to be bad ones. But I find – I really like the Yo Mushi Pedal one uh, mm-hmm. for a lot of reasons. I think that's one of the best ones of the sports ones right now. And I'm enjoying Baby Steps because it's kind of lighthearted. It's not really too deep. And it's kind of an, a kind of an interesting angle at the way the main character is. He's not like this wonderkind, you know, like he's he's naturally talented and he's shot down or, or he's like super. Well, again, like ping pong as well, I think, has a lot of good aspects to it. So um, but I've only seen well, there's only been one episode of ping pong so far, but it, that was an usually, episode. <laughs> it wasn't. I mean, I, I, I had to rewatch it a couple times because I found it so interesting yeah i, I love I mean, his style you well, not even ugh. not even just not even just that i mean style alone which is you know great and we'll have to devote something later to that sometime. we have to do an episode on uasa just straight up just yeah Uwasa. uh we will do that eventually and and also once ping pong's done airing we'll definitely be doing one on ping pong yeah. um but i i think just also characterization is really interesting yeah and it's weird it, like it, it it, it takes certain things that you expect from the sports anime genre and just fucks with them, and it does it really well, and I like it. It's weird. Like, uh, we know so little about these casts already, and a lot of the, the character traits are really negative for the cast of Ping Pong, but I really like them. I don't know why. Like, why do I well, – why is my favorite character in the show already, like, the, the, the Chinese guy who just basically just being an asshole? Why do I – like, like, you because know – Because you can see where he's coming from. They, they give you that tiny little look into his past and – And you can feel knows, why he's so frustrated he ex- by this as and well. And he expresses his anger, but you understand where that anger is coming from, and it doesn't feel shallow anger. It doesn't feel like, you know – I'm the bad guy. I'm evil. You know, like and you also feel why he's being so nasty at the end of the episode as well. You know, it's like he's like, you know, if you come up against a I guy need, who's I so full of him. himself, it's like, you know, I need to destroy him in order to teach him a lesson. And even yeah. he even made the comment like, you know, it's like hiding I'm back your him reality. You know, that was yeah. kind of the other. He, thing he also too. made the comments like hiding your strength from an opponent, or you know, or being you know, uh, like you know, is insulting to them. You know, don't insult your opponent by you know uh, holding back, holding back exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so there's there's some really interesting stuff going on. Yeah. So that's of of those shows. Yep. Um, in terms of Western shows, animation wise, um, Clarence has started up, which is Cartoon Network's new show. Um, I've only seen one episode, so I don't have too much to say about it. But it kind of has it's it's charming. I, I think it's kind of charming. I've never um, even heard of that one. I, I know some people. Me. I know some people really think it's it's really funny. I think it has comedic elements. It just hasn't gotten to me just yet. But, what, what, what is, uh, I'm going to sit on um, continue watching it for a little bit and kind of get a better sense of where it's going. What, what, but again, what, I've only seen one episode, so it's hard to. What what what, what is it about? I've never actually heard of it until you've mentioned um, it. Now. It's <laughs> basically this kind of. Um, I don't want to say awkward because he he's not like Tina awkward, but he's kind of. He he's kind of this odd little kid, and he kind of gets into adventures with his two other friends. He's kind of like the center of this friend group of this very very like OCD style uh rigid kid and then he has this other kid who's completely the opposite and they kind of form a trio and there's like this kind of delicate balance between them um the the first episode i think is up on youtube as a preview mm. when they go through like this kind of like a mcdonald's play place and it's actually so well observed on what what those play places look like and felt like and things like that and it it's pretty interesting um, there's there again, there are some good gags in it. It's not like Bob's Burgers funny, but it's still charming and delightful. And well, I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's bad by any means. Bob's, Bob's Burgers first season was also rough in and of itself. So, you know, That's you true. have to give them a chance to establish stuff. <laughs> I mean, Bob's Burgers, if you, but we'll just go back a little bit. If you folks decide to check out Bob's Burgers, just make sure to give it enough chance, you know, give enough time. The first season is good and it, it made me laugh a lot, but it really got its legs best, you know, by the second and third season. Yeah. And that and that's the same for a lot of shows. That's certainly um, sure true for The Simpsons, even. Yeah, I mean, and the same thing for Parks and Rec and a bunch of other TV shows. That it usually takes a little bit of time to establish the characters and yeah. and kind of work out the way they want the world to work. Uh, Buzz Burgers, I think, just caught on, like landed on its feet a lot 
faster than most shows do, yeah. though. It, it's also a lot of them tr- learning, like, where they have these characters and how far they need to turn the knobs and kind of twist it and adjust it to get them feeling just right and what the audience likes. Yeah, exactly. So, well, this has been Animation Dissection. We hope you guys uh, keep watching, and if you guys have suggestions, please hit us up on Twitter. You can find me at R.Y. Magnuson. You can find me also on Twitter at S.A. Zorak. So, tune in next time for another episode.